begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Father, we want to place our lives into your hands. And as, as we have heard sung, Father, we want you to change our lives. I just pray that you'd rain down your Holy Spirit upon us this evening. Just pray that you'd make your strength perfect in my weakness. I pray that this message that is shared would, would inspire, bless, and challenge your people tonight. I pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Good evening and happy Sabbath. It is a blessing to be with all of you, uh, albeit virtually, to share a message from God's word. Um, I just want to let you know that I live in Northern California. I live about an hour east of Redding, and I'm in a very rural area, and I have to rely on a satellite dish for, for internet. And so if there are some delays, um, you'll know that it's because of the satellite dish. Anyways, at this time, um, if I can share screen, I'm going to put my PowerPoint slides up. All right. My message this evening is titled The Most Inspiring Story. I want to share with you the most beautiful, most amazing, most inspiring story I've ever heard. It reminds me much about the story of Joseph in Genesis. It's a story that only God could have written, and it is still being written today. The most beautiful story outside of the covers of the Bible. Whenever I'm struggling and tempted to throw in the towel, I often think about this inspiring story. Now, before I share with you this most incredible most inspiring story, I want to look at a very important parable in God's word. I want to look at the parable of the talents. Now, before actually looking at this parable and focusing on it, I want you to understand the context. The parable of the talents is one of three parables in Matthew chapter 25. First, you have the parable of the ten virgins, which is also a very important parable. The second is the parable of the talents. And the third and last parable in Matthew 25 is the parable of the sheep, sheep and the goats. All three of these parables are very important for God's people who are watching and preparing for the second advent of Jesus. These three parables teach us how to watch and be ready. Matthew chapter 25 follows Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 and 25 are a unified, cohesive whole called the Olivet Discourse. In Matthew 24, Jesus specified certain signs that were to show when his coming was near. And he bids his disciples to watch and be ready. But he doesn't tell us how to do that until we get to chapter 25. Jesus teaches us how to be ready three, through these three crucial parables. The first parable teaches us that we must have more than just the knowledge of the truth. All ten virgins, the foolish and the wise, all had lamps which represent the word of God. It is not enough to have a regard for the truth and to advocate the truth. We need to yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit's working. We need to live lives dependent on and guided by the Holy Spirit. And the parable of the sheep and goats teaches us what living out Christ's purpose actually looks like. In this parable, Jesus describes people who have made love the central theme of their lives. You know, speaking of this parable, we are told in Desire of Ages, when the nations are gathered before him, there will be but two classes, and their eternal destiny will be determined by what they have done or have neglected to do for him in the person of the poor and the suffering. In the judgment, this is what it boils down to. So very, very important. So these three parables, once again, are very important because they teach us how to watch and be ready. Now let's focus in on the parable of the talents before we get to the most inspiring story. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Who does this man who is traveling to a far country represent? 
it represents Jesus, who when speaking this parable was soon to depart from this earth to heaven. And who do the servants represent? They represent us, the followers of Christ. Verse 15, and to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Do you know what a talent was worth back in those days? A talent was about 6,000 days wages. Do you know how many years that is? We're talking 16.4 years. So if you are an individual who has received, you think you're the individual that has received one talent, don't be thinking that you were given chump change. One talent is 6,000 days wages. Verse 16, then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. Verse 18, but he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of these servants came and settled accounts with them. Verse 20, so he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you have delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Verse 22, he also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. How many of you are planning to hear these words? Well done, good and faithful servant. You know, just two days ago, I spoke with Carl, uh, Carl David, a man who reminded me of these faithful servants. I'm involved in a prayer ministry called 24-7 United Prayer. And for a while, we've been looking for a volunteer with a background in accounting who could serve as an assistant treasurer. We've been praying for a while that God would provide the right person who could serve. And recently, David Carl found out about it. And, and he said, I'm interested. I'm willing. I did a couple of reference checks, and I was very impressed with this individual's track record. And two days ago, I called him up. Now, based on his res resume and the year that he received his BA in business, I assumed that he was in his early 70s. I was a bit surprised and impressed to find out that this man is now 80 years of age. And the reason he wanted to serve is because he wants to do something for the Lord. I mean, at that age, if he wanted to retire, who could blame him? But he wanted to be active in working for the Lord. I was so impressed. You know, there's a chapter in the book, Christ's Object Lessons, about the parable of the talents. And the chapter talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, mental faculties, speech, influence, time, health, strength, money. It even talks about kindly impulses and affections. All of these things are talents that God has given to us to use. All of these things represent the goods that Christ has committed to his servants. Let me tell you about my friend Thomas Beale. He is a software engineer. When I do evangelism meetings, I use an online interest tracking software for evangelism called Disciples. Perhaps you've heard about it. Perhaps your church is using it. Thomas took over Disciples back in 2012, and he's been improving it ever since. Now, 
on the website, there's a button on the bottom right hand corner you can press if you need technical support. And when you push that button, an agent becomes available to chat with you online. When I was first using, uh, learning to use the software, I was often in need of technical support and I would push the button which would connect me to the next available agent. The funny thing is, is that the same individual would always be available when I press the button for help. And one day, this individual shows up again and he, he tells me that he's over in Europe. He was working on a master's in software engineering in Oxford. And I'm thinking, what? If you are in Europe, because I'm in the United States, you must be up in the middle of the night because of the time difference. What he told me is that he set his phone so that he gets a notification when someone needs technical support and he gets up during the night so he could be of assistance. Thomas Beale makes himself available 24 hours a day, seven days a week to help people use disciples, which is a very important tool when you're doing evangelism. Now, is that some serious commitment to evangelism? I don't like to get up in the middle of the night. I mean, I'll get up for emergencies, but I typically don't like to wake up during the middle of the night. And if you're a doctor, sometimes you have to get up in the middle of the night when you are on call. And you may not enjoy it, but you get up and you get paid well for what you do. Thomas Beale, on the other hand, doesn't get paid a dime for what he does. It's all volunteer work. Why does he do it? Because he wants to do his part in the work of evangelism. In Christ Object Lessons, page 326, we are told to his servants, Christ commits his goods, something to be put to use for him. He gives to every man his work. God has given different gifts to different people. He has called some to be software engineers. He has called others to be doctors and nurses. He's called some to be teachers. He's called others to be working in the business field. Each has his place in the eternal plan of heaven. Each is to work in cooperation with Christ for what? For the salvation of souls. All of us are called to use our talents to work in cooperation with Christ for the salvation of souls. You know, I love that hymn. Are you ready for Jesus to come? Verse 1 goes like this. The theme of the Bible is Jesus and how he died to save men. The plan of salvation assures us he's coming back again. Are you ready for Jesus to come? Are you faithful in all that you do? Have you fought a good fight? Have you stood for the right? Have others seen Jesus in you? Are you ready to stand in your place? Are you ready to look in his face? Can you look up and say, this is my God. Are you ready for Jesus to come? Friends, I believe with all my heart that Jesus is coming soon. Jesus longs to come soon. And the question is, is are you watching? Are you being faithful with the goods that have been entrusted to you? There was a day when I was not faithful. Many, many years ago when I was young, I, I, I went to church. I went through the motions, but I was not faithful. I loved to church hop. And I was always asking the question, what can the church do for me? When I should have been asking the question, what can I do for the church? And the Lord wanted to save me. Did you know that God calls some people into ministry to save them? God calls all of us into ministry. But he called me into full-time gospel ministry because he loved me and because he wanted to save me from myself. And as I began serving as a pastor, he began teaching me about being faithful. And the way he taught me was through the example of my faithful members. I appreciated so much my members 
who would show up early on time to church. And I appreciated those members who were faithful and dependable. They were given work. They were assigned a position. And they did their work faithfully. Not to gain recognition, but because they wanted to please Jesus. God taught me through these people about the importance of being faithful in the little things. You know, I'm not like Thomas Beale. I can't get up in the middle of the night to help people with their computer software problems or, or with their personal issues. But I can show up on time to church to set a good example. I can be faithful to the commitments that I make. I can show up to church for the prayer meetings. I can use the gifts that God has given to me. Friends, I want to encourage you to be faithful in the little things. Faithful with the commitments that you have made to Christ and to the church. I wanna share with you the most inspiring story that I've heard. It's a story that only God could have written. And the story inspires me to be faithful, especially when I'm tempted to be unfaithful and tempted to be lazy. And friends, I hope this story will inspire you to be more faithful in these last days as we prepare for Christ's soon return. The story comes from Africa, from the country of Kenya. It begins in the slums. Kenya's slums are home to over 100,000 orphans. One out of five will not live to see their fifth birthday. His name was Charles Muli. One day he wakes up to what is every kid's worst nightmare. He wakes up and finds nobody. Everybody is gone. He realizes that he is completely alone, abandoned. His dad was a drunk. His dad would often come home drunk and would beat his mother. The dad must have figured Charles is six years old. He could survive on his own. Can you imagine? You are six years old. Your parents and your younger siblings are gone and there's no food left in the house. He was abandoned. He was rejected. So Charles goes out and begins knocking on the doors of his neighbors. He's looking for someone to help him. Nobody helps, so he becomes a beggar. And for the next 10 years, Charles Mully wanders the streets. He is begging, he is stealing, he is doing what he can to survive. He says, I became hard, I became full of hatred, I became a street boy. And then I started asking myself, why I was really born, why I was really living. One day, he's feeling quite suicidal. And then he meets somebody who invites him to go into a church. And for some reason, he decides to go into the church. And there's a man who is preaching. He is preaching about forgiveness and faith. He is touched by the message. He knew that he had a lot of bitterness in his heart towards his father. The preacher said, work hard, and by faith, there's nothing impossible before God. The message stuck in his mind, and a new hope was planted in his heart. Are you in need of hope and encouragement? I want you to understand that with God, all things are possible. Charles is determined to change his life. He decided to go to Nairobi to start a new life. He had no money, not a single cent in his pocket. He walked for three days in rags to get to Nairobi. Because he never finished school, he didn't know what kind of a job he would be able to get. He finds the biggest house in the city and he knocks on the door. An Indian woman opens the door. Charles asks her if she has any food or any water. The woman can see that he doesn't have shoes. And he says all he really wants is some work. Well, she sees something in him and decides to give him a chance. He is scrubbing the floors. 
He is washing the dishes. He is cutting grass outside with the other hired workers. Charles works hard. He is faithful and he is given more and more responsibilities. The Bible says in Luke chapter 16, verse 10, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. You know, many of us give 100% or 110% when it comes to our careers because it means promotion and it means pay raise. When it comes to God's work, when it comes to your work for your church, are you giving 100%? Friends, in most churches, we have 20% of the members doing 80% of the work. Friends, if we want our churches to become living churches and working churches and devoted churches in these last days, this needs to change. We can't have 20% doing 80% of the work. After six months, the Indian woman spoke to her husband, who was the CEO of a very big farming company, and Charles was promoted to manager. He, is, he was now over 800 workers and is now running the entire estate. And while he is working as the manager of the farm, one day he sees this beautiful young lady. She smiles at him. Charles never dreamed that a woman would ever smile at him the way she did. He musters the courage to talk to this young lady and long story short, they got married. And he was such a happy man. And soon he has a family. He gets a car and he had a dream. He wanted to do business. So Charles is saving his money and saving his money. And finally he buys this little taxi bus. Mooley Ways was his trademark. And he starts driving 14 hours a day until he makes enough money to buy another vehicle and another and another until he has a whole fleet. And then he's leveraging the money that he's making from this fleet of buses. And he formed Muli Ways Agencies Limited. And then Muli Tires. And then he gets into real estate. And he does really well in real estate. And then he has a monopoly in oil and gas. And life is very good. His wife said, we lived a life of riches because we were on top of the class. We had parties and dinners all the time and had so many guests, so many visitors that used to come. It was wonderful just to be feeling so influential. He says, it was my time. He was traveling around the world. Charles Mooley became a, mold, a millionaire. He was one of the richest men in all of Kenya. He and his wife, Esther, had eight kids, a big house, multiple businesses. But something feels wrong. Anybody tonight, you've got the house, you've got the kids, you've got the career, but something feels wrong. One day, Charles gets out of his car and these young boys ask him for money. He said, why should I give you money? What have you done for me? They said, we will watch your car for you. Give us money. He said, I will not give you my money. Later that day, Charles comes back and his car is not there. He had to take his own public transportation home. Muli says, I was really tormented by these boys in the streets. I saw faces of me. And for three years, he had no peace and he is struggling. And one day he says, I could not work anymore. One day, Charles left his office and got in his car. He kept driving and driving. He did not know where he was going. And then he pulled over. And then he began crying in the car. He cried saying, why are you doing this to me? With all the wealth that I have, why is it that you want to take me back again to poverty? He struggles with God for four hours. And after four hours, Muli said, yes, God, use me. And the moment he said, 
yes to God, he experienced the greatest joy in his heart. Have you, have you said yes to God? Have you surrendered all to God? You want great joy? Say yes to God. He goes home and he has news to share with his family. He tells his family that he is selling all of his businesses and he's never going to work for money again. He wants to help street kids just like him. Well, his family thinks he has gone crazy, he has gone mad. This is total madness. Charles goes into the streets and he befriends these drugged out, dangerous kids. He tells them his story. He tells them about love and forgiveness and hope. And these kids start to trust him. And then he brings these boys home. And then more. And then another. What would you do if your spouse brought a child home? And another. And another. They begin to run out of room, and so he builds a dormitories in his backyard and a classroom. He hires a teacher. He brings more kids home. And now he's got a few hundred kids living at his house with them. But they are running out of space, and they're running out of money. Then Charles decides they should all move to the land he's bought for retirement in the middle of the desert. Now they've got hundreds of kids and they built temporary housing. They are walking hours to get fresh water because it never rains. Meanwhile, Charles is still going back and forth to the slums and picking up more and more kids to help. They have run completely out of money the, and the wife says, what am I to do? Charles said, don't look to me, look to God. And the next day, a wealthy friend of theirs donates a truckload of food at the last minute. And then one of their adopted kids dies from typhoid and they are devastated. Charles and Esther are praying for fresh water every day and every night. This is because the children will get sick and die from contaminated water. They are praying for water. They are knocking on heaven's door and their biological kids are sure their parents have gone mad. Charles wakes up in the middle of the night. He's hearing a voice in his head and the voice says, walk 30 feet this way, 40 feet this way, and 100 feet that way. And dig and there you will find water. They begin to dig and the workers just quit. They, they say, there's no way. There's no underground wells in the desert. And in the meantime, some of the kids are digging this hole that gets deeper and deeper until it's 20 feet down. And of course, there's nothing but dirt until they hit rock bottom. But Charles is still raving to keep digging. Use the pick's ax, he says. One of the youngest takes the pickaxe and water gushes out. And there is this enormous, organically formed fresh water reservoir right there. I know it all sounds completely made up at this point, but it's true. They had water in the desert in an area where there are no wells and the children stopped getting sick. The water was also being used in the farm to irrigate farmland. Muli said, people in Africa, in Kenya, even the government depend on donations from the Western world. And he wondered, what can Africans do to change that attitude? Muli kept thinking about how to build a project that would be self-sustaining. The farms do really well. They are growing green beans. And these green beans meet the international requirement for organic labeling. And so Charles begins exporting to Europe and becoming self-sustainable. Now, by this point, he has over a thousand children. 
And he has them all planting trees in order to change the climate. The trees would create increased rainfall. They plant over a million and a half trees over the next five years, and this desert landscape develops its own microclimate. When Moli bought this land, there was nothing. There were no trees, no water. Through planting trees and through water conservation, they transform this place. And he starts providing water and food and services not only to the children, but to the neighboring villages. And Muli builds playgrounds and dorms and classrooms and medical centers. And over the next 27 years, they plant over 6 million trees. And Charles and his family rescue over 12,000 children. How many children? 12,000 children who were once just like him. Isn't that beautiful? God saved him. God rescued him. God blessed him. And now God is using him to rescue others, to save others, to bless others. And Charles Mully says, this is a model that can be replicated everywhere. This is the largest family in the world. Muli says out of 935 schools, Muli Children's Family was number one on national examination. His daughter Moeni says they are becoming doctors, they're becoming teachers, they're becoming managers, they're bankers. It's amazing. Not counting the 84 who are currently in the Kenyan universities and colleges. This is a family of people who care for each other. Charles Mully says, for you to be here, for you to be alive today, it's a miracle. For you to be the way you are, it is God's miracle. Let me tell you, I worked 25 years and I worked because I know everything is possible. Friends, I want to remind you that with God, all things are possible. You may be facing a situation that seems impossible, and, and with men, it may be impossible. With God, all things are possible. I'm telling you, let's remain focused in our studies and in everything that we do. Let us remain focused. Let us work hard so that we can change the world. Moli Children's Family has expanded to five locations in Kenya where they continue to provide medical care, education, food, and clean water to thousands daily. What an amazing story. Friends, life is God's gift to man. What we do with it is our gift to God. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 330, in the Parable of the Talents, we are told the Lord has a great work to be done, and He will bequeath the most in the future life to do to those who do the most faithful, willing service in the present life. Here's, here's one more quote from page 361. Our reward for working with Christ in this world is the greater power and wider privilege of working with him in the world to come. Friends, Jesus is coming soon. And when he comes, he will be giving out rewards. Now, please understand, we're not saved by our good works. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We're not saved by good works, but we are rewarded. We are rewarded by our works. And friends, I just want to encourage you in these last days to be watching and to be faithful faithful in the little things, faithful in using the talents that God has given to you. May God help us all to be faithful. Amen.